While others are talking about Schrems 2 ruling, we are talking with Max Schrems himself. Internet Vikings, in collaboration with Home Security, is conducting a free webinar, The New Era of Transferring Data, live with Max Schrems. Together with Max, we'll discuss latest developments in the field of data protection, impact of Privacy Shield invalidation on data transfers, future of standard contractual clauses, practical steps for businesses, and much more. Our webinar starts now. Webinar brought to you by Internet Vikings and Home Security. What we'll be, be discussing today, none of your business. Well, actually, if you're on this webinar, you know we're discussing something that is super important to your business. Since June 16th, 2020, when the European Court of Justice declared Privacy Shield invalid in the ruling known as Schrems 2, data transfers and privacy protection have become especially hot topics. The implications and repercussions for businesses are huge, but it is not that easy to figure it all out. That is why today we are pleased to welcome Max Schrems, the lawyer who is responsible for this ruling. Maximilian Schrems is a world-renowned lawyer, author, and privacy activist. Now, when you were a kid, you probably wanted to be famous. So you thought you might want to be a rock star or a professional athlete or something like that. But did you ever know that you could become famous by becoming a lawyer? Well, not just any lawyer, one who slays giants. Max became known for his campaigns against Facebook for its privacy violations, as well as complaints filed under GDPR against Amazon, Apple Music, DAZN, and other big tech companies. Most recently, his name became associated with the ruling of the European Court of Justice, which invalidated Privacy Shield for it not providing adequate protection. Schrems is the founder of NOYB, European Center for Digital Rights. That's right, none of your business. Our event today will consist of three parts. The keynote presentation by Max Schrems, followed by a panel discussion for which Peter Eckmart, CEO at Internet Vikings, and Stefan Helberg, CEO at Home Security will join Max, offering their unique perspective on the data privacy issue. Then we'll have Q&A time, where you will be able to hear answers to your own pressing questions. So feel free to use the chat to ask them. However, we did receive several questions from you already via the reg forms, and we will address those as a priority. Before I turn the mic over, I want to thank all of the media partners who supported the promotion of this event. Our special thanks go out to Young Entrepreneurs of Sweden, Sigma Group, Sports Betting Community, Swedish Data Center Industry Association, and AO.News. These are the companies that helped us reach out to you, as, as many people as possible, because this topic is so important. So just to get things going a little bit before we start the main show, uh, I wanted to address a couple of very important questions that have been going around in social media this week and see if you have some answers. Feel free to put them into the chat. Very important from Facebook this week. What movie did you watch as a child that scared you? Also, what is the first place you went to by plane? And very importantly, let us help you find the name you might have if you were an elf by giving us the last thing you ate and the name of your first pet. Well, obviously I'm joking. We don't want you to put those things into the chat. These are clearly uh, data privacy issues that are out there in the real world today. But it's not just clever, sort of fraudsters on social media that can steal your data or get access to it. State and non-state actors have many other ways to get at data, including the legal means. And that's where today's stuff really comes into play. So uh, I, I am keen to get things rolling. I will just mention that with such a diverse audience we have from the registration files, it's amazing. And I have great news for all of you, regardless of where you are or which industry you work in. In case you have any more questions related to hosting or cybersecurity, there will be an opportunity to book a free personal consultation with experts from Internet Vikings or Home Security. So please use this chance to figure it all out with the help of seasoned industry professionals. At the end of the webinar, we'll share the link by which you'll be able to do that. So now, without any further ado, I will give the stage to our keynote speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Max Schrems. Thank you, hello, and thanks a lot for the invitation. 
Um, I'm just going to go through basically a first presentation, hoping that I can cover basically most of the questions in, in the initial round. Basically, we're just going to go through a rather wild ride through the whole data transfer debate. There is tons of elements to it. It's a rather complex. Uh, we talk about American law and European law and how all of that interact. So uh, please buckle up. It's uh, a load of information, um, but to understand it better, that's oftentimes necessary and that are already answered later. The whole thing started basically with upstream and prism. So uh, Snowden had these slides that he disclosed and that for a first time gave us an understanding of how a lot of that US surveillance happened. Before that, there was a lot of rumors um, and that actually gave us a bit more insight. So even though the graphics were a bit interesting at the time, it uh, shows you that there is upstream and prism, which are the two main surveillance systems um, that the US is using to our knowledge. Um, upstream is basically getting the data from the internet cables to into the backbone and uh, prism is more about um, getting the data directly from the companies. And in this slide, you could actually see the different companies and, and how it all works. We don't have to go into the details, but it also gives you the names of the companies at the time that were connected, that were um, actually using these systems. And that was new because before that there was only rumors and here we actually had like even the dates and, and the exact times that um, everybody was, was connected up. Um, by now, there are probably a lot more companies. So for example, AWS is not included in these slides, even though they're now a big player. Also 1881A, that's the same law in the US, it has two numbers. Um, and basically that law requires that you have an electronic communication service provider. So your usual cloud provider, telecom provider, hosting provider, anybody like that. There's a definition of that in law if you're really interested in if a partner in the US is falling under this law or not. And the only other thing that the law really needs is so-called foreign intelligence information. And that's a very, very broad term. It basically says any kind of information that is of relevance for the United uh, States government. So it doesn't have to be terrorism. It, it can also be um, just intelligence, um, espionage, all of that. Um, so depending on the sector you're in, there may be other reasons than just um, private information that um, you wanna take care of, of these surveillance acts. Under the law, there is then basically a certification for one year. So the US government usually says that there is some court approval, but it's actually just an approval of the whole surveillance system, not of the um, actual person or the actual data that was collected. Um, there are so-called minimization and targeting procedures included, um, but they're mainly here to actually get rid of US persons. So um, under the US constitution, the surveillance would also be illegal, just like under European law. Um, just with the difference that the U.S. Constitution um, does not cover the rights of foreigners. So the solution of the U.S. is to basically just filter Americans because they are protected and um, have foreigners be under the surveillance um, to make it um, compliant with U.S. Um, constitutional provisions. Then there's a so-called directive that is actually going to the individual service provider. So that's kind of your little piece of paper ordering you to um, connect up. And that's usually done through an API or something like that where there's not much uh, details about that. The interesting part is that all of this second part of the slide here is classified. So we're not allowed to know how that actually looks, how it's actually done, um, that it exists. So um, that's the only reason we know it's there. Um, if you now look at the European law, there is um, basically a general rule that you cannot export data out of the EU. It's basically a total export prohibition and export control. So um, the situation basically leads to the, the, the situation is basically that you're not allowed to send any data abroad. Um, the idea is that if we have protections in Europe and you then just send data abroad, they, you would undermine these rules in Europe. Um, at the same time, there are derogations. So um, there are obviously reasons why you must send data abroad. That's your typical email or, I don't know, booking of a hotel somewhere in New York. Um, there, obviously, you have to send data abroad. And there's not really a way um, to avoid that. And that's recognized by the law and that's generally legal. Um, the bigger issue in reality is oftentimes just outsourcing. So just um, sending data abroad without any legal reason or a requirement to actually do so. Um, and there, there are different instruments. There are so-called adequacy decisions, um, standard contractual clauses, but all of them basically expand GDPR rules to non-EU countries. So it basically uh, makes sure that if data travels abroad, the laws travel with it. 
Um, and there are certain restrictions to, to doing that. And that's the main problem if um, you look at international data transfers. To maybe um, go a bit into examples of, of how this could look like, um, we can basically take a look at the agreement we have with uh, Switzerland. Um, so in the Swiss case, there's basically a bit of like a privacy bubble. Um, we are in the European Union having our little GBR here and Switzerland has its Data Protection Act and they're very similar. And this uh, similarity allows that there is a free flow of data without the need to have any like serious paperwork because you're basically sending it to another country that follows more or less the same rules anyways. And that's recognized by the European law. Um, so I was just basically saying that if there is a contractual situation, um, you have the problem that, for example, a US company does not fall under these surveillance laws. And um, you then basically have the problem that you need some contractual arrangement to get them into your privacy bubble. In that case, uh, we usually have the SECs, the standard contractual clauses, privacy shield, binding corporate rules. Um, so basically this should make it, uh, should make this US company be compliant with European law and you could have your data transfers. That's not just for the US, that's really for any country in the world that doesn't have uh, data protection rules. So you basically fill that vacuum with a contract. Um, the big problem with the US is that basically the surveillance law that I mentioned before um, requires surveillance while European law requires privacy. So as a company, you now have to comply with two things. Under European law, you have to protect the privacy of your users. Under American law, you have to provide all the surveillance opportunities. And that is basically why all these instruments fail in the end. Um, they cannot do both. They cannot um, provide privacy on the one side and surveillance at the other side. And that is why these instruments fail twice at the Court of Justice even. Um, if we look at our case, basically, um, I'm a little basically user here in Austria and um, my data goes technically to Facebook Ireland, um, which are for tax reasons to provide us for Europe. Um, but in reality, most of that data goes to the US um, on service there. And there are two ways that the data is captured. Upstream is basically the backbone of the internet. So whenever the data um, travels um, on the backbone of the internet, which is international hubs, et cetera, where there's basically skimming off the data. And then there is so-called PRISM, which is the actual um, tapping into the servers of Facebook where you get the raw data. The difference is that upstream can, for example, not capture encrypted data, while PRISM can get that data because it's in plain uh, format, usually at Facebook, or they can at least decrypt it for the NSA. Um, there's two different instruments, FISA and 12333. I'm not going to go into that, but um, there are two different legal bases that they use for that. All of that we basically presented to the Irish High Court, who sent this whole case off to the Court of Justice already in 2000, uh, I think, 14. And we then got the decision in 2015, the first time around, where um, for non-lawyers, there's kind of a proportionality test in Europe. So you have a situation from no interference, if there's no problem with your fundamental rights, to usually a proportionality test. So we usually say, is it is it OK or is it too much? And then there's the so-called violation of the essence, which is on the very right here. And um, a violation of the essence is, is basically meaning that a violation is so fundamental that there is no way to ever overcome it. And in the first judgment, the Court of Justice actually said that there is such a violation, that we're actually in this area of, um, of essence where we don't need to do a proportionality test anymore. We don't have to check if this could be somehow legal. It's definitely always illegal. And that is very bold because it's quite honestly the only judgment the Court of Justice has ever put out where they found a violation of the essence. They usually say that something is illegal because it's disproportionate. Um, there were a couple of other findings that um, third countries have to have effective detection and supervision mechanisms, that um, they have to have more or less the same law as Europe, and there has to be legal redress um, in line with Article 47. And interestingly, that is a bit more than we request from our own countries because European countries fall under some of these laws once they do national security surveillance. So national security of the member states, but only of the member states, is actually exempt from law. Um, so many member states um, are actually doing similar things, but do not fall under these surveillance laws, which is an especially interesting element of EU law there. Um, what did the European Commission do? They basically just passed the whole privacy shield a second time around, um, just uh, the whole safe harbor a second time around, just with a name, 
that was privacy shield and the text of it was basically the same. So the court of justice said it's illegal and the political solution was to just pass the legal text the second time around. Um, we back then basically just analyzed it and realized that there is minimum upgrades in the commercial part of, of how you can use data, what companies can do, but there was basically no change in government surveillance. Um, the government surveillance part um, was more or less the same. There was a review now and a little ombudsperson that um, didn't really help much at all. Um, we basically back then already called that lipstick on a pig. Um, it was kind of obvious that this whole thing is not going to go anywhere and that it will probably be killed the next time around it goes to the court of justice. And this second round actually happened rather quickly. I personally didn't want to go to the court of justice the second time around because I felt everything was said already. But um, what happened is that the Irish um, regulator basically told us that Facebook never used Safe Harbor, what we were told it used in the first case, but that they actually used another instrument, so-called standard contractual clauses. Um, and the that meant basically that we had to rephrase the whole procedure and run it a second time around. So what we did is that we updated the complaint and basically said there's a solution in the system, which is so-called Article 4, that basically says that a regulator, like in this case, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, can just stop the data transfers in this individual case. Um, the DPC did not do that. They did not take action, but they filed a lawsuit against me and Facebook. So I was actually a defendant in this case. And there were tons of um, additional parties. The US government intervened. It was a, a big circus really in the courts. Um, and we basically had then a reference by the court of, um, in Ireland again to the court of justice a second time around with altogether 11 questions that were um, more than anything a normal court can usually uh, deal with. Um, in the second time, uh, we actually had submissions from all the parties. We had uh, seven parties in Ireland. We had the European Commission, the European Parliament, the EDBB, the European Data Protection Board, the EU member states. Um, there were letters by the Court of Justice with questions. There was the hearing in Luxembourg, and there was the Advocate General. And put that all together just to kind of give you an idea is the irish regulator invested about three euros into this case we did the same we think facebook invested something for probably between five and ten million euros into this case we had six weeks of hearings in ireland more than forty-five thousand pages that were submitted i don't think anybody has read them all um there were 25 lawyers usually in the irish court and we had about 17 submissions at the court of justice so in simple terms every fucking argument was made that you can possibly make and um, was debated. And this, uh, this judgment is probably one of the most detailed judgments or some judgments we've seen on any of that. But if you drill all of that down, there were basically three core arguments. Um, the um, Facebook basically said that they never used Safe Harbor, but the standard contractual clauses. And their core argument was that they said that there is no surveillance in the, in the US that is going beyond EU law. So they basically said there is no problem, so they don't even know why this case should even be here. Um, we basically argued that um, there could be targeted solutions, so that basically if a recipient in the US falls under these surveillance laws, and only in that case, then the regulator should actually stop that transfer. But we do not have to stop it globally, we don't have to stop it uh, for the whole US. Um, we basically had this idea of a targeted solution. Um, the regulator in Ireland, the DPC, basically said that all of this is systematic and they don't want to really take any action, um, but they want to invalidate all data transfers globally under the SECs, which I usually call the nuclear option, which is, um, would have really put a lot of totally legitimate data transfers in, in, in legal jeopardy. So finally, um, what was the outcome? The Court of Justice basically sided with our solution and said that this Article 4 is the solution and that basically regulators have to find and stop data transfers that um, go to US recipients that fall under these surveillance laws. Um, all of that was literally in my first complaint in 2015 already. So we had five years of litigation to figure out something that uh, was easy to figure out in an afternoon. Um, what was super interesting is that the Court of Justice also held that there is a duty of the data protection authorities to enforce the GDPR. So it's not basically an option for them to, to, to take action or not to take action, but they actually must take action. Um, what does that mean for practical consequences in the sense of if you are doing data transfers internationally, how can you get a bit of an idea of, of where you're in here? 
Um, basically, you can still be feel free, feel fine if you have these derogation place. So your usual email abroad or your booking abroad, all of that usually under Article 49. So there was a lot of this um, dramatic talks that you know the internet is going to break together tomorrow. Um, but actually, under the derogations, that should work well. Um, the bigger problem is really outsourcing, and that is what what really troubles the industry um, since that decision. I got to say that most of that wasn't a law since 1995, so it's not really new. It was just basically ignored for a long while. Um, but in this outsourcing situation, you basically have this issue that this expansion of GDPR rules may conflict with that foreign law, especially in the US. Um, it's the same if you have a adequacy, a standard contractual clause situation or a binding corporate rule situation. The instrument using doesn't really change any of the problems here. Um, and that is where you have to take a closer look. I'll try to do that in a couple of groups now um, to basically group possible situations where um, we can go through if that's legal or not. Um, obviously, the individual situation may need a bit more um, in-depth analysis, but in, in simple terms, that, that would probably help most people. Um, first of all, there is a lot of data transfers that are not personal data in the sense of if it's, I don't know, video data of some, you know, webinar or whatever in this case that would be and so it would be personal data but um you have tons of other stuff that may not be considered personal data big data analytics for i don't know geo um stuff and whatsoever all of that doesn't fall under gdpr so you don't really have any problem there anyways um there are these exemptions as i said for necessary transfers so your typical email flight booking hotel booking even though these things are right now under corona probably not the most prominent example um but the big junk is obviously um situations where you have outsourcing, where you basically just use a US cloud provider um, to um, to watch or to, to, to use um, US uh, cloud services. Um, and that is basically the big issue. And there you have to clarify if your recipient in the US is a so-called electronic communication service provider. There, It's defined by the law, so you can ask them this specific question. We even on our NOI webpage have a questionnaire for that um, if you want to figure that out. Um, if that's the case, you very likely have no option to, to use the service further in any legal way. Um, there is an additional problem that um, the FISA laws also apply to service in the European Union by American providers. So a lot of the American providers said, no problem, we're just going to host your data in Frankfurt now um, or anywhere else in Europe. And the problem is that FISA still applies to these server centers in Europe. And as long as there is a technical possibility to access the data in Europe from a you know, US um, headquarter, um, then we actually have a problem. There are ways around it. There are ways that you know, the keys are kept somewhere separate and the US company simply doesn't have access to that. But we haven't really seen that um, you've been used in practice. So um, that is actually one of the biggest tricks that a lot of the US companies are trying to, to play on European business, I think, is to basically tell them you're good once the data is in Europe, which is simply not true. Um, there are situations where a US recipient may be a normal company. So let's say um, you're, I don't know, a steel mill and you have a company in or you a sister company wherever in the US, a steel mill would not fall under electronic communication providers, so you can have data transfers here. So for a lot of the, so to say, normal business that is not IT business, that may be a way of um, having this issue by looking at your recipient in the US. The big problem here is that your recipient itself may use a cloud provider <laughs> and falls under the law again. So that is has some application, but that much in reality. There is a solution that is proposed by the Court of Justice, the so-called supplementary measures. Um, However, if you go through really applying them, you will see that there's basically two options. There are technical supplementary measures um, that more or less um, make sure that the US government factually does not have access, which means, for example, encryption in transit, encryption if you have that data like backups, um, or any kind of a zero-knowledge zero approach where your US recipient is simply not able to read the data and therefore not able to forward it. I'm not aware that that's actually much practical use in cloud applications because you usually want them to process your data. Um, but theoretically, these options would work and they would also be compliant with EU law. There are now a lot of so-called contractual arrangements that are proposed. Um, and they usually um, go around um, disclosing 
that there was any information uh, that there was any information disclosed to the to the U.S. company um, that you get informed about that and that they in some way try to resist. None of that really helps you with U.S. law because. Um, that would always usually conflict. So, for example, obviously a U.S. company can resist, but under the law, they simply have to provide that data, so their resistance is not going to go very far. Um, they can also inform you about it or tell you that there was a disclosure to the NSA, um, but under U.S. law, they're not allowed to make this disclosure. There is a so-called gag order. Um, so you can have that on a contract that they will try to inform you, but if you're not allowed to inform you, this is not going to get you anything. Um, so usually these issues don't really get you far. I recently made a tweet on on what, uh, what Microsoft proposed. That is basically their proposal, and literally every part of these proposals is either already part of the GDPR, so it's not an additional measure. It's just what the law says already, um, or it actually doesn't help you at all. Um, and that is um, s s not even slightly, but but really trying to. Um, Deflate people into not understanding what what these arrangements are, um, and I think a lot of that is simply deceptive. Um, the European um, Data Protection Board, that's in charge of issuing guidelines on that, also um, made uh, case studies and basically declared that. And there's two cases I think that are relevant for for most users. The one is number six, is that uh, there is any provider abroad that actually. Um, has access to the data, and that is your situation that I described before, and they say you can't really do that anymore. The other case is basically remote access to data. Is that situation where the data is kept in Europe, but there is still remote access from the US side, and they also say that you can't really um, use that legally and do that legally. So you also have of data centers that are basically managed out of the US. Um, all of that is not overly pleasant, and we usually try to find solutions for stuff as well. Um, and I'm a big fan of proposing how people can, you know, go on with their business while complying with the law. Um, the problem here is really that we have a conflict of law. So unless the legislator changes that, there is really not much of a solution. I think in the long run, we would have to uh, internationally propose that there has to be baseline privacy laws for everybody, independent of your citizenship. So if you're data from Europe goes to the US, um, it's just as protected as US data. And I think it's a fair proposal because if the US wants to be the cloud provider of the world, it's fair to ask for baseline security for the rest of the world as well. Um, but right now, all of these arguments are really stuck in the US Congress. So um, I think unless US Congress moves, and we all know how US Congress is not overly keen <laughs> in moving on many issues, um, we, we will probably have that issue for for the time being, and I think especially if people have larger systems, new projects, and 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 big um, big data pools that they have to manage, there will in the long run be a need to probably localize that to a certain extent. Even though I'm a big fan of data localization, but it seems right now to be one of the only options to be somehow compliant. Um, that would be the last part that I wanted to make. I hope it was somehow understandable, despite technical issues and I put my stuff back into the picture there. <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> well, thanks, Max, for this insightful presentation. There's a lot to unpack there. And obviously, there's there are a lot of implications for our clients and those people that are in the audience today from multi sectors. And so we're obviously keen to get into a discussion and see what we can do about this. And we have some experts to help us do that. So we're very pleased to now welcome Peter Eckmark and Stefan Telberg to join Matt for a panel discussion. Peter Eckmark is Chief Executive Officer at Internet Vikings with seven years of experience in the field of IT and 14 years of business development experience in the iGaming industry under his belt. Peter is definitely one of the most knowledgeable and seasoned professionals within this sector. Stefan Telberg is founder and CEO of Home Security. Stefan is one of Europe's most prominent entrepreneurs within cybersecurity with over 20 years of experience in the field. Amongst other issues, Stefan has been working with security-related questions on GDPR and NIS, which is Network and Information Security. Welcome, Peter and Stefan. And there we go. Thank you very much, Chris and Max. Wow, that was... Uh, quite a deck of slides. We had some, some issues here in 
of that, but I think that uh, that was perhaps um, only us because I saw in the chat that some were good, which is great. Anyways, I'd just like to, to highlight that uh, even though I do have some experience in my sort of previous life, I'm not by any means a lawyer and I cannot give any legal advice. But it's very next slide, Max. And I'm just wondering, I'm very curious, what is the ultimate driver for your work? What is it that you're actually trying to achieve? Um, I think in that it's it's more of a long-term question that we um, make sure that if we're online, we can trust systems and that you know data is is not going crazy places, um, which is partly a privacy issue, but to a certain extent also a matter of, of uh, business secrets, confidentiality. So a lot of um, businesses that work in an area that is more you know prone to, for example, sanctions or so on, um, they probably have other reasons to look at that as well. And I think in the long run, we I'm a big fan of technology, and I think most people that work in the privacy sector are the kids that you know, took apart their computers when they were like little. <laughs> and, um, but we need to achieve what we can somehow be secure and be safe and be not have to worry that all of it ends up at some as a big data center, um, which is different for people. Some people are more, you know, activistic uh, journalists, whatever that may be targeted. Um, others are targeted for business reasons. Um, but I think we need to get to a world where um, we don't have to worry about that whenever we use our phone. Can I have a few yeah, questions? I... Max, I was you 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 mentioned here um, uh, if the data ends up in an NSA data center, right? But what is the actual issue with that? What what happened? I mean, what would happen if the data ended up in, in the NSA data center? Um, that reaches from not getting a visa to targeted killing, quite honestly. <laughs> so we have um, the we had a recent case that um, SDKs that were built into apps were used to to figure out where people are to then have basically forward at these location information to the U.S. military. Um, we have, um, for example, in Austria, usually a neutral country, so we have a lot of trades usually with Iraq, Iran, Russia. It's it's very common for traditionally in Austria. Um, a lot of that may fall under sanctions from a U.S. perspective. Um, similarly, you have, I don't know, now the debates about um, Nord Stream 2 and companies engaged in that. Um, so you have many of these different issues. It reaches from being on a security list on some flight to the U.S. Um, to not having your visa to um, very serious issues for people that usually is not a problem for Europe, I got to say. I mean, we don't have drones from, from the U.S. flying over our heads. Um, but there are parts of the world where that is actually an issue. Um, it's, it's luckily not such a big issue, um, but but there are a lot of these these possibilities. Um, and quite honestly, if you go into that area, there is more and more people that had their in interesting experiences at the airports and so on, um, suddenly being mistaken for someone else and so on. Um, I think that's kind of the more kind of practical consequences. The other issue in privacy is usually a feeling of surveillance. Like once you have the feeling that you're surveilled, uh, you limit your freedom of speech, you limit what you put online, you limit, um, you know, what, I don't know, which pages you go to. Um, and that also has this chilling effect. So I usually, personally, I think the second is the bigger issue because it, it really targets much more people. Um, and you don't have to necessarily be conspiracy theorists that um, some of these things really um, are issues for people and where they're worried about. And, and I think um, there are these reasons. And as a lawyer, it's very simple. It's the law to a certain extent. So there's also a question of, of following through with the law that we have. Would it be a threat to the democracy in the end? Um, I don't think we've seen that so far with the NSA, but definitely we have this whole debate about Russia, Russian interference, Chinese interference, and so on, where, um, which is very important to underline because I, as far as I know, there were questions on that as well. We really looked at the U.S. because, quite honestly, the U.S. is right now the biggest provider and our data actually, to a large extent, goes to the U.S. Um, but with the rise of China, with certainly um, uh, certain Russian apps that are around, um, and probably a lot of other countries in the world, um, this issue may be an issue for other countries as well. Um, in, in practical terms, when you look at where data goes in Europe, it just goes factually to the US to a lot, largest extent. So that's the reason we looked into that, but it's an exclusive issue. And um, to finish that up as well, uh, we do have surveillance capacities like that in Europe as well. 
um, love data, but there is always the German rights that um, the Convention of Human Rights would, would be to an extent. Um, but it's not that unique to the US as well. So um, it's, it's a pretty big uh, world there. Thank you. I, I guess it's fair to say that if you were to have your data uh, at a big US um, supplier of cloud services, you would subject yourself to a risk and whatever that risk might be. Um, if you were to utilize a, a European provider, are there any European laws uh, that would be more like the Cloud Act, which I guess is the big problem uh, here, that would subject to the same kind of risk? Or would you be yeah. in a safe harbor, so to speak, <laughs> if you were to utilize <laughs> there are two the European parts line? To question. Um, from a practical perspective, our laws like that in Europe as well, usually what's mentioned was always the UK, which now falls exactly the same problem as the US, because um, as long as they were a EU member state, they could say, you know, it's a national security of a member state. So we're good. Um, now we're not a member state anymore. So their national security is to be treated just like American national security. Um, secondly, there are usually the countries within the EU that uh, have capacities in that direction. We usually talk about Germany, France, um, Sweden to a certain extent. Um, that's usually the ones where there, we know that there is more surveillance going on. Um, other countries, for example, in Austria, we don't even have a secret police. Like we have a police force that's in charge of terrorism, but it's you know normal police officers in reality. So um, there is big differences in EU member states, and and that's definitely a part that is interesting to look into. Um, but the reality is that the capacities in Europe are just to a certain extent lower. That's the factual side. On a legal side, as I mentioned before, Article Four of the EU treaty exempts national security from the from GDPR all these privacy laws from the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. Um, so in a simple term, the risk for any kind of compliance issue is simply not there because it's exempt from the law. And uh, that is something that is a bit hypocritical. <laughs> and, um, that is something where if you host in Europe, you can definitely know that you're compliant with the law to that extent um, because these issues are simply exempt. Uh, go, going back to one of the answers that you had there, uh, Max, uh, you talked about, and a lot has been uh, about US, obviously, uh, and, and there's probably a good reason for that. Would it be likely that you would have a similar case against Russia or China? I mean, would, would that happen, or do you, and do you consider the issue to be the same with these countries? I think to a large extent they are the same and they may even be worse um, if you think about, you know, rule of law in the U.S. versus um, some other candidates on the globe. Uh, we definitely know that the rule of law is, for example, not a big issue in the U.S. Um, but right now we just didn't come across many of these cases. In reality, even if you look at, you know, the so to say Chinese apps or Asian apps, they still host on US servers oftentimes. So um, it just didn't have, have that much practical application, and at least for us, I think the important thing was to clarify the law here. You can now apply the law to every country in the world and you'll get different, the same result more or less. Um, and I personally haven't looked at all the possible of China. Um, that would probably be a whole PhD thesis of its own. <laughs> Yeah, and you don't want you might not want to run that court case against uh, China again, right? We don't want trends three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> no, but it's it's, it's interesting because uh, coming back to what you mentioned now, if I look at the you know if you look at the top ten IT companies in the world, uh, you know it's 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 mainly populated or exclusively populated by U.S. companies, right? So it, obviously a lot comes back to U.S. Being in cybersecurity, which I am in, uh, there is, you know, if you look at the top 10, eight out of 10 is US companies. So obviously it's kind, kind of relevant. And also one thing that I notice is that these companies, it's not just that you have these big US companies that, that dominates the market uh, when it comes to infrastructure, uh, different type of services, cloud services and so on. They're also the top acquirers of, U, uh, of European companies startups and smaller companies, right? So they end up in the US also. Um, maybe, I can only confirm that to a large extent. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe we could bring up the, the timeline on the screen uh, and we can talk about that uh, uh, 
a little bit. Yeah, so this one. So I have a question here for you, Max. Um, if you look at the timeline, so you mentioned say Farber, we go back to 2000, right? Um, and then you had, we go to uh, 2015, uh, say Farber was revoked. Um, and then you had Privacy Shield and Privacy Shield was disqualified obviously uh, in, in last year. Uh, if you look on the other side of the timeline, you have a lot of things going on in US, right? You have the US Patriot Act, you have the Snowden and NSA stuff going on and also the Cloud Act. It seems like there has been like a constant chase, right? Uh, something is happening in Europe or outside US and then you do these acts, uh, you do the uh, kind of, let's put it like paperwork or legal work uh, and then, you know, it's disqualified or revoked and then you do something else. Uh, you touched on that a bit in your presentation. You know, I think that's a highly interesting question. What can we expect in the future? Is this going to continue? Is this timeline just going to be stretched and, uh, you know, just be longer? Or what do you think? Um, yeah, I think there is, unfortunately, a high likeliness as this is only going to get worse. And quite honestly, I already thought about two or three things to add to this timeline in the back and forth. Um, and we'll see that probably in more areas, uh, not just privacy, but um, we have different concepts in the EU and in the US, about, for example, freedom of speech, about um, online harassment, about uh, many of these other issues. It depends on which sector you're in, but, but you know, there is probably 20 other of these issues. And if you zoom out, basically globally, the internet was simply not regulated for a long while. Basically, it was you know, virtual space that law felt is, is somewhere outside of, of natural boundaries or whatever. Now we see the opposite. We see more and more and more regulation to regulate everything online all over the place. And every country does that in parallel and usually not in a very coordinated manner. So um, we will see more and more legislation and that will conflict more and more because simply the political and, and, and democratic views and um, I think that will, for certain, lead to more data localization because, as a company, you will simply not going to be able to comply with two or three rules at the same time if they're conflicting with each other. That is not a world I want to underscore that three times. That that I think is 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 desirable in any way. Um, but unless we can at least get among the Western countries to some kind of consensus of what we feel is baseline, you know, freedom of speech, baseline privacy, baseline harassment. Um, charges, you know, whatever you, you feel is, is topic, you will get into these issues. So I think it's it's not unrealistic to to say, okay, at least in the European Union, we managed to have one system with the GDPR here, and in most other areas, we're very similar, so there's not that much divergence. Um, but if, you, if you're basically then on the Chinese market, they will demand from you that you, you know, forward them all the data. You have to do that somehow on that market then. And, and that basically leads to, to different systems that are split somehow, which is not desirable, but I think it's, it's gonna happen more and more. My hope is that we're gonna get at least among Western countries some agreement. There was talks about a, let's say, no spy agreement, however you wanna call it, that says, okay, we all agree that there can be a free flow of data, but we also agree that we all have these baseline guarantees to not really spy on each other like crazy. Um, and I think that's the only way forward, but that has to be put coming out of industry, especially in the US, unless half of the Silicon Valley is screaming and saying we need proper regulation because otherwise we can't go on with business anymore, uh, the US, pol US politics will simply not move. Uh, that's that's the unfortunate part. So, so you wouldn't believe that we would, um, or US would kind of break the trend somehow down the line here and say, okay, we need to look into the local laws we have and see if we can comply with, and you said Western, I, I think Europe, we can comply with Europe. Do you think that will happen? Is it likely that that will happen anytime soon or anytime in the future? I think it became much more likely with the second judgment. The first judgment was basically ignored in the US. They more or less said, you know, these crazy Europeans are not gonna, you know, they, they misunderstood it. The court of justice didn't get European law. That was the biggest narrative um, in the US that our Supreme Court just doesn't know European law. Um, but they know it better. <laughs> and, and when the second judgment came around, it, it was kind of unavoidable to, to to realize that that this is not moving on. Also for the European Commission, that for the first judgment just said, okay, we're just going to pass a new thing. Don't worry, move on. Um, it, it's going to be harder and harder to ignore that. And um, so I think there is 
possible momentum also with the Biden administration versus the Trump administration. Um, but I'm also a realist, unfortunately, <laughs> and, and these things probably take a long while and it's going to be very hard to tell in the US to give rights to foreigners because that's basically what we would have to do. There were these reforms in the US after Snowden, like US citizens, a lot of these things were scaled back. It's not a one way street. It's not always more surveillance. There were uh, definitely shifts to, to less surveillance. Um, but only for Americans. And, and that is the big fundamental problem is you have to sell in the US that it's going to hurt them really bad unless they give rights to foreigners. I, in a, in a short punchline, I said it's a bit like, you know, Switzerland saying, give us all your gold. But once the gold is here, you don't have right to property. And no one in the world would ever, you know, trust the bank anymore. <laughs> but that's kind of the proposition that the US is doing right now. And and it's it's interesting that it works that well um, because it's kind of a bold announcement. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Going back to you, Peter. Yeah, I was just wondering, since the baseline here is that you have a conflict of interest when it comes to privacy and surveillance that you say, and that seems to be a problem that cannot be resolved. Would um, if you were to use a, a, a US cloud supplier, would using encrypting your data be a solution for it? I mean, then the surveillance part would perhaps be circumvented. Yeah, there are two parts where encryption can help. So there is the in-transit surveillance that is basically the upstream surveillance, which I mean globally is baseline anyways. I mean, if you have international if you have data transfers online that are not encrypted, you're violating the GDPR. So um, there is probably not much um, <laughs> Easier, to be honest, um, even though we found out after Snowden, even Google apparently didn't encrypt all the data flows between the data centers, was amazing. Um, but um, independent of that, the big problem is once the data rests in the US, how it is encrypted and how that's done. Now, there are proposals to say, you know, there's going to be a key and it's all going to be some zero knowledge system. Quite frankly, I haven't seen a system on my table yet that anybody really implemented that did that properly. Um, there is a lot of confusion and the US industry tries to, to generate that confusion more and more to say, oh, we, we encrypt stuff once it's on our service, but that's irrelevant if they have the keys with it. Um, there is talks about, yes, you can encrypt, for example, um, backup data, which is fine. There is an area where you can actually do that, but then you, you're simply just hosting it abroad. You're not processing it anymore. So um, I'm not the tech expert, tech expert here. Probably other people can help on that more. Um, but once there is a factual assurance that no US entity can actually see the data or use it in any way, yes, then encryption would be a solution. Hmm. Um, I'm sometimes wondering why go down all these complicated things? I mean, oftentimes, I mean, I, I don't want to promote anybody, but you can literally host a lot of stuff in Europe. We have all of our NOIB stuff in Germany hosted. So my Schrems 2 compliance took exactly one minute. Um, and if you think about all the costs and the overhead that all of this technical legal blah blah entails to somehow make something legal that is fundamentally kind of a broken system. Uh, or if, if, if many people invest money in the right stuff. Um, and it's I'm talking about my profession to a certain extent. Obviously, lawyers love to make more paperwork because they make money from it. It may not be the simplest solution to have the 31st additional paper with a US entity that, that is going to be ripped apart in court sooner or later anyways. Um, but that's my personal view where I think some of my colleagues may not agree. <laughs> uh, Follow-up right, question, Max. Um, so, and, and this was a frequent uh, question from the attendees. Uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so the question is, um, is there a way to continue to use Microsoft 365, previously called Office 365, uh, in a legal way? Because obviously then you come back to, you know, it can't be encrypted, obviously. It needs to be clear uh, because you, you want to have email communication and these, these things, right? So it's not technically possible to encrypt everything. So, so what would be your answer to the, all the people, which is, uh, you know, a whole lot of people in Europe using Microsoft 365 to a very large extent, everything from small companies to large enterprises. Um, quite honestly, we're looking into that right now in different cases, and even Microsoft couldn't answer these questions properly. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's the unfortunate answer. Um, there was an attempt by Microsoft that I thought was rather interesting, this, this German cloud idea of saying, you know, we're only providing the software anymore 
And basically all the data is, I think, was at the time processed by the German telecom and they have all the keys and we don't even have access to it. That could be a solution that, that would allow to have like, you know, a Microsoft product that de facto is run by someone else um, that could probably under the law sustain, but Microsoft has actually stopped that product. So um, that that was actually the only solution I've seen so far that made sense. Um, I, I have to underline there may be other solutions we just don't know yet. Um, what I hear from companies, um, the likes of Microsoft, is that they basically hope that this is going to go away somehow. Like whenever we have talks with uh, big tech companies, uh, the answer is politics should solve that, not us. We're just going to continue the products as they are, and we're going to do nice marketing PR around it to say we have some paperwork that you can sign to, to feel better. Um, and that is a bit the approach that, that I see mainly in the market, which is uh, quite astonishing given the potential fines and, and so on. Uh, I picked uh, something from the, there's a lot of activity in the chat here. Obviously people are a lot in, engaged in this uh, topic, which we're happy for. Um, and this is also a frequent question. Um, so uh, obviously you, we talk about US companies, but does it make a difference if they have the storage in Ireland or in any other location in Europe? I mean, this is a very frequent question I hear it all the time. Does it, does it matter or is it still an issue? Um, it doesn't matter in that sense that Pfizer does not have a geographic scope. It just says any European, uh, any American electronic communication service provider. So otherwise, I mean, in simple terms, Microsoft could just bypass the NSA by putting a server across the, the, the state line to Canada or <laughs> Mexico, whatever. Um, so the, that is, and that's not exceptional to the US. Uh, the Cloud Act is oftentimes criticized, but quite honestly, all the procedural acts I know in Europe also say if you have access to something abroad on the server, you still have to give us the data. So that's not that exceptional to be honest. Um, FISA is exceptional because of this mass surveillance. It is not individual cases where a judge approves that that person really has some reason to be under surveillance. It's mass surveillance. And uh, one big problem even with European um, uh, hosting is that there is arguments in the US, I'm not a US law expert on that, but at least the experts I talk to say that there may be even less protection because um, it would then usually fall under this executive order 12333, which is basically fair game. That is basically that the president can just sign something and it goes ahead without any legal basis, without any court even being involved in it. So um, there is an argument that actually once it reaches the U.S. shores, there is a bit more protection because it at least falls under that law. While if it's a mile outside of the you know, international, once it's like one centimeters in the international waters in simple terms, uh, there's really no regulation anymore and they can do anything. And that's literally what the US argued also before the Court of Justice that um, there is simply no even protection on the privacy shield for anything that happens outside of their territory. Yep, thank you. Back to you, Peter. But some sort of, yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say that some sort of surveillance might be justified, right? I mean, we, we do have Absolutely. terror uh, reasons, reasons for terrorism, et cetera. And, and I think when I read through a lot of the material ahead of this uh, webinar, I, I thought that there was this term strictly necessary being used, but I'm not a lawyer again. What is conceived as strictly necessary? I think the big difference is that the US law assumes that a foreigner is a terrorist and a national is not. And I think if we learned anything over the last 10 or 20 years, um, it doesn't depend on citizenship, how messed up your brain is. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's, that is the fundamental problem in this legislation that it is based on citizenship and not on any risk assessment on any objective criteria. Um, and I think that is fundamentally, not just from a legal perspective, a problem, but from a practical perspective. Um, if we want to find terrorists, we're not going to, you know, first identify passports and say we're going to identify the people that are abroad and, and, and not nationally. Also on that narrative, I think it's important to look at the scope of the definition of um, foreign intelligence information. Um, it's, for example, just a threat of an international crime. So in, in simple terms, if a little Mexican is throwing drugs over the fence that Trump just put up or may attempt that that is technically a threat of an international crime because it's international you know drug smuggling and you don't need even the crime you just need the threat of a crime so um the definition is so broad that we're far away from just terrorism and and stuff that we probably all agree on um we are probably oftentimes even in this, if you think about that we negotiate trade agreements with the us 
if um, we know that Belgacom was under surveillance by the US because half of the Brussels bubble is locked into these networks and you can then figure out what the other side is thinking. And this is more of a geopolitical game here than, than your individual little terrorist somewhere. So on that subject, would you say that this is more of a political issue than a legal issue? It is to the large, let's say the problem is a legal problem, the solution is a political solution. And that is the unfortunate part of it. Usually I always say, you know, if we talk about cookie banners, you can say, you know, put the button there, make it somewhat visible and you're good. So we usually can, you know, offer a solution. <laughs> Here, the solution really lies in international politics. And, and that is really frustrating, I think for everybody that um, you can probably cope with the situation and, and try to, um, you know, remanage stuff or find technical solutions to things, but you cannot really solve the problem yourself, which I think generally humankind is not eager to be in that situation. It usually frustrates us. Um, but but I think it's 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 important to acknowledge to to get somewhere and and, and get going with stuff that we, we are simply not able to solve that right now. The two solutions are that we abandon the fundamental right to privacy in Europe, which would require all member states to change the treaties. Um, or that the U.S. changes its laws. That's kind of the two solutions in the end. So, so has there actually been any cases that could, could guide or serve as precedent where the GDPR breach has been, you know, disputed due to a cloud act interference? Or, or if that has happened, would we even know about it? Meaning that could, the, the authorities in the US the have, have access, to, access to information and, and we wouldn't even know. Yeah, I mean, generally the, most of these companies put out uh, transparency reports. So if you want to know how many you know, data sets AWS has provided, you get that in these transparency reports. Some of the numbers may be a bit um, interesting. For example, Facebook puts out the numbers of user accounts that were targeted, but that means that if you target my account and I have 500 friends on Facebook, you probably got their messages as well. So these numbers may be a bit, you know, lower than than in reality. Um, but it gives you an idea of which companies fall under it. Um, the big ones all do, um, and that gives us some transparency there. Um, there were attempts to push back. There were attempts by the U.S. companies to at least be able to allow these aggregated numbers. But there's definitely no way that you inform an individual person about the fact that he was under surveillance. Um, there is no knowledge that anything like that ever happened before. Um, and yeah, I think that is kind of what, what we know on that side. Interestingly, from a European law perspective, the, the European law is very kind of um, protective in that sense that um, it's not, you don't have to show that someone was actually under surveillance or that um, a company actually provided the data. It's good enough if you are an electronic communication service provider. The idea is if you send it over now and the, the NSA knocks on the door tomorrow, the data shouldn't have even gone there. <laughs> so um, there is arguments now by especially the US industry to say there should be a risk-based approach. And you know, if there was too much surveillance, it may still be okay. There is really no word in the GDPR, whatever, that would support such an idea. And it was also rejected by, by the European Data Protection Board. It's just that a lot of the industry sometimes just doesn't want to hear these you know, truths. <laughs> and um, so they are, uh, there is a lot of, there's probably hundreds of lobbyists that now try to find arguments why this somehow else. Um, and I think all of these arguments were put before the courts twice now and they haven't succeeded. Uh, it didn't kill them. They're still around and people make money with putting out these arguments, but, but it doesn't really get you anywhere in reality. Uh, I had another question here that was from one of the attendees. Uh, I think it's somewhere from the um, educational community, looks like that. And I'll just read a question uh, and I'm interested to hear your answer, uh, Max. How do you convince the board of directors at any kind of school to, to stop transferring data to US? Um, management on average are not interested in GDPR uh, and privacy uh, for students or clients. And you know what are the alternatives so I think it's a general question, you know, how, how do we make people listen? Yeah, um, quite honestly, that's the biggest problem so far, especially to a large extent because the regulators did not enforce these things so far. They are still kind of a bit wait and see. Um, just today there was one decision, for example, by the um, 
Portuguese regulator that told its national statistics company that it cannot use Cloudflare anymore and, and um, basically prohibited that. Um, but we're just seeing these cases coming up. And I think unless these cases are present and public, there will be a lot of reluctance and wait and see. Um, I think there's another level to that is if we're especially in the educational sector, it's, it's interesting on what type of infrastructure we put our future generations on. <laughs> and if we train everybody that, you know, you have your stuff in the company X cloud and, and you don't have, you know, an open source option or whatever in your, in your computer, which is kind of going to re, you know, generate this whole <laughs> problem that we're having here uh, further and further. And um, we oftentimes, at least in, in Austria, had these debates that there should be, you know, people should, the first writing thing they should have is probably not Windows Word and uh, Microsoft Word, but maybe some open source solution, um, just so that people are aware that there are alternatives. And I think that that's important. Um, the other part is, especially if it's uh, public sector, it's also just a matter of having agency over it. I think it's, it's hugely important that our governments have agency over that power, uh, have agency over that data, really have the power to do something with it, um, compared to just basically buying uh, U.S. products and, and lose also the possibilities to 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 run your own systems. I think it's important that each country has you know their own IT infrastructure and 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 backbone and knows how to run that. Um, best example for that was now Corona. We had huge debates on like you know tracking apps. Oh, they're somehow in the Microsoft Cloud, which may not be the biggest problem really from a privacy perspective, um, but it's the reason why people didn't use them anymore. And you have huge acceptance issues and so on. So um, there is a lot of these elements as well to consider. Um, I hope that's somehow helpful. Um, but yep. uh, the biggest problem, I think, is going to be enforcement, unless there are hefty fines. Everybody's going to be like, okay, this costs us a lot of money to, to switch. Um, it's complicated. We have other stuff to do. Let's just keep it as it is. That's you know how tech systems oftentimes work. <laughs> it might be a part of the education nowadays, right, to, to, to teach our children to look at alternatives. Exactly. And to, you know, what the difference is between a cloud service and having it on your own machine. And there are benefits to 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 both. <laughs> and, um, but people should be aware of it and, and know the alternatives. Um, and quite honestly, I mean, we're a small NGO, um, but we usually run our systems ourselves as well. But it, it requires that you have an IT person that is in charge of that, that, you know, um, takes care of these things. But a lot of these things you can also buy from European vendors. I think the biggest problem is that European vendors are oftentimes just not that visible. And and the go-to is just a big American company. But for many of these things, you, you do have alternatives in Europe as well that, that people could use. And unless people use them, they're also not going to grow. So um, I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg issue. Yeah, sure. Over to you, Peter. Well, I'm, I'm a simple man and I have simple questions. I think I've seen from the chat as well, if, if we are supplying cloud services, and I, I think I would like to know what are the actual consequences in, in an iGaming operator, a finance institution, a medical institution would, would actually face if they were to utilize uh, AWS, Google Cloud, or similar services? What, what are the risks? Um, the, the things we see the most right now is uh, usually workers, um, if you're, you know, you usually have your unhappy workers union about something else, then privacy becomes a topic. That's a very common one. You usually have your unhappy customer and they then look into your privacy policy and file a complaint. Um, that's kind of the most common versions I see personally. Um, oftentimes what I saw more is that, for example, this, this case today in, um, in Portugal came on the basis, I think, of complaints about something else on that platform. And then they looked into the data transfers and actually realize that all of that goes to Cloudflare. Um, so there are these different avenues. The reality is still that um, GDPR is not heavily enforced. Um, it, there, is, there is definitely that problem. Um, I think the big shift is going to probably happen in two years once the collective redress uh, regulation in Europe is going to be around. There is already tons of appetite for doing class actions. And um, a big issue is that you can get emotional damages. So if you have, let's say, a million customers and all of them want to have 500 bucks in emotional damages. Um, that's probably much bigger than any GDPR fine you could possibly face. Um, so it depends very much on the business sector. There are, you know, if it's schools, then you will have that one parent that is very unhappy about it. 
it depends a bit on on the business i think but we usually have um in, in in the emails we get we usually have a lot of people that are just in reality unhappy about something else and then privacy becomes an issue i would say that's 50 percent and then you have the 50 percent that really look in the privacy policy you know just really unhappy about it um i noted something that a swedish uh, government agency uh, announced you can read it on the website it's the swedish government agency for personal integrity I'm not going to say the Swedish name on it, it's very complicated. Um, and they said in their recommendations, and I think this is highly interesting, uh, they, they say that based on SREMS 2, the, the SREMS 2 ruling, um, organizations should try to find alternative legal solutions to work with US vendors. What, what is your comment on that? Because what, what could possibly be an alternative legal solution here? Uh, that's the unfortunate part. We see a lot of these recommendations that have um, that call kind of for the you know pink unicorn in a way. <laughs> and quite honestly, if it would exist, I, I would be more than happy to present it. I mean, if there's a solution to that, I'm I, I would be all up for it. Um, but uh, right now, I mean, the alternative solution may be instead of privacy shield, the standard contractual clauses, which again can work if you if your recipient in the U.S. is not an electronic communication service provider. So it's a bit hard to say all US transfers are always bad. There are situations where in that individual situation, that's okay. Um, if, I don't know, your SIS and you send booking data to the US to your SIS sister company or whatever it's, or daughter company or whatever it is, you will probably be able to do that under the standard contractual clauses. Um, and then that's a solution for you and that's the alternative that is okay. Um, in the broader you know, daily operation, you usually have some uh, cloud provider in the U.S. and there, the SEC is also conflicting with the with the U.S. surveillance laws. Um, that was also explicitly spelled out by the Court of Justice, so there is not really an argument here. Um, Might just be another uh, another pick on, uh, you know. Might just be another pick on try to put makeup on them. That might be the solution, right? Yeah. <laughs> But again, I mean, there are sometimes solutions to certain things. There is probably combinations of some solutions. There is debates in the US how to probably add something in executive orders and so on. But um, some core issues, which is, for example, that there's simply no court in the US you have a remedy to, like there is just no place you can complain. Um, it's something that will be very hard to overcome unless there is legislative change. I have a question from the chat here, which I've seen many times. Uh, wouldn't the solution for the, the bigger US companies be to set up a, a European entity, uh, which is not just a legal arm or, or um, that has a separate setup, in, of course, in, in, in Europe to circumvent the, the problem? Yep. The Cloud Act? That could be a solution. Um, that's a business, a bit of a question how your company is structured and how much you can, for example, order a you know CEO to do something or not to do something. Because if you, for example, have a stock company under, under Austrian law, you can usually as a shareholder not order the boss to do anything really. Um, and that uh, CEO would basically fall under European law, would violate the GDPR, would be liable for all of that if they would actually you know provide the keys, blah, blah, blah. Um, that could be an option that you basically set up a system like that. Um, it's kind of interesting that no one has tried that so far. I think the the hope is still that, again, it's going to go away somehow. Um, and therefore, they haven't even tried these things. That's very similar to the Microsoft Germany solution. They just have basically a separate company doing that or an external company. Um, but you could probably even do that within a company that you say, OK, there is a independent entity for a certain jurisdiction that takes care of that. That is a solution that would actually be rather interesting. You would have to dig into company law, corporate law issues, blah, blah, blah. Um, but technically, that's an option, yeah. I would see it's a very complicated thing because there cannot be any, any ownership ties, right? And, and that sort of limits your ability there, to set up that company there are options without have having ownership. a real There are options to have ownership without having a say, for example, a direct say. Um, the typical thing is the Austrian stock company. I think that's similar in many other countries for stock companies um that you can elect so to say the ceo and you get the profits but you cannot actually order the ceo to do a or b um that could be an option something like that and but that definitely is 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 interesting elements 
And the reality right now that we see is that most of these stock companies in Europe are just shell companies for tax avoidance reasons and are not really having their own decision-making power anyways. So um, that would be hard to justify in, in, in such a situation, but um, there is room for that. Um, look at, uh, this is from a kind of a cybersecurity perspective. Uh, now we talk about personal data and, and the Schrems 2 ruling and the case was about personal data, GDPR, Europe, uh, US and so on. Um, coming from the cybersecurity industry, obviously, uh, what used to be an on-premise product, you had it in your data center, didn't necessarily communicate with anyone outside your company or organization. Nowadays, that has transformed into a lot of cloud-based services, right? And, and again, uh, coming back to my top 10 list of cybersecurity companies, it's basically US companies, all of them. So what is your view on different type of data? Because personal data is one thing. Now we're talking about even could be potentially even more sensitive data. It could be something that could be a risk for your, yeah, for you as a nation, basically. You know, if, if let's say, uh, very sensitive data about vulnerabilities that you have inside uh, your environment as a government agency in Europe, and you're using a cloud-based product where you can process the data, you can do things with it, ends up uh, in the hands of the US uh, government. What is your view on that? Wouldn't that be even worse than than doing the same thing basically with personal data? Because you know th th there's just different different you know criticality coming into what type of data we're talking about here. And and personal data is somewhere in between, right? But you have some things that could be even more serious. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert in that area <laughs> um, to put that out there at the beginning. But I can tell you what the US law says about that and basically doesn't differentiate. It doesn't say it has to be personal data. It just says any information that is relevant for the foreign conduct of the United States. So if I am the NSA and I need to get into the Belgacom system, and I know that they have some, I'm just making this up, some security provider that knows tons of their configuration, <laughs> then I would probably go there first to figure out how I get into that system if I already have half of the configuration somewhere lying around on the Europe, Europe, uh, US server. I'm not aware of security companies being used for that so far. I'm, that may be something that you know much more about than I do. But from the but from the legal perspective, that's, that's definitely possible. I mean, there were was always debates about security companies being used for that um, globally. That's not a US specific issue, um, but that's not unrealistic in my personal view from the law. I don't know how much the companies make sure that that doesn't happen. That is something that uh, we know for the big cloud providers that they are basically complying with FISA and provide that information. I'm not aware of that information for security companies right now, but that's something that would be interesting to research, I guess. Thank you. Basically, the conclusion is that there's no difference in how U.S. government, NSA and so on, could look into your data if it's personal data or if it's some kind of other sensitive data, right? Just to, to make it very clear, we usually think about data of a person that, you know, is a criminal, there is some reason. So we usually have a person-based idea of this. Um, U.S. law does not have a person-based idea. FISA basically has the idea of it's relevant, it's just data that's relevant for us, no matter if it relates to a person, to, I don't know, a submarine or whatever else, yeah. and, um, and or, you know, an IT setup. So there is not really any differentiation in the law here. Peter, um, uh, some more questions yeah. from the attendees? There are lots of questions, but I can only see a fraction of them in, in the chat. Um, I, I think I saw one question earlier, um, and the, the baseline was that why didn't this, um, why, why wasn't this addressed by the EU themselves? Why did you have to pick up on protecting the citizens of the EU? And there is another question here from Per that ties into that, and how can we support you, Max, and get involved in this ourselves? Um, yeah, so basically, I'm I'm still surprised that that I became a story or that my you know fights were reported about and so on. Because in reality, we have authorities that are in charge of that, and we we actually paid them quite a decent sum of money. I was just in a uh, in a hearing before the Irish Parliament yesterday night um, with the Irish regulator that basically does not decide about any of that. The case is still pending there for eight years. 
we were at the Court of Justice twice. We were in nine courts so far, and she doesn't even have made the, her first decision yet. So we're still dancing with a chicken to lay to lay its egg for eight years here, and and um, that's that's kind of amazing. And I think that is the reason why um, me got my act activity became a story, which is weird. I mean, if a citizen just says, "Hey, actually, that's illegal. I file a complaint. This should not be exceptional." Like this happens a hundred times with some neighbor complaining about noise or whatever a day. Um, that's that's not news. Um, but in the privacy sphere, it was news because there is just a huge lack of of regulation and enforcement here. Um, so I think that is that is that. Um, I myself work on that still as uh, on a pro bono basis. So we also basically transfer that now in an NGO. It's called MOIB. Um, and the NGO is meant to basically do a more structured long run system because it cannot be a single European that's held into the cameras of being like, oh, that's a privacy guy. Um, we need to build systems that, that work on that. And MOIB is meant to do that. And anybody can become a supporting member from one euro up to endless. Um, that's usually how um, to cover the second question of how to possibly support what we're doing. Um, but we're also happy for feedback in, you know, for example, for technical issues, we now um, installed a secure drop for, you know, um, options to um, have whistleblowing if someone came across stuff that that is super interesting. Um, so we're also interesting for interested in any other kind of information or support that that is around. I've also heard that there are similarities in between the Cloud Act and the Chinese national intelligence law. And again, this has become somewhat political. I, I believe that's also the foundation for the US resisting Huawei to be a 5G license taker, uh, because obviously it goes the other way around and the Chinese authorities would be able to withdraw data from the US. And that was actually super interesting because in the first round, which Rams won, they basically said that all of this is protectionist and crazy, and how could you possibly, you know, stop data transfers? Then when Huawei came around and TikTok afterwards, <laughs> suddenly the US was actually very aggressive. I mean, they basically said this company, TikTok, has to split into two companies globally, which is quite honestly uh, another ball game here than what Europe is playing. Um, and it was totally accepted as, as normal and obvious. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting that once they were on the receiving end of this whole circus, that um, the, the, the narrative was suddenly very different. <laughs> we're seeing a lot of that now, I think, and even so in the close future, because the vaccines roll out, for instance, Chinese will only allow the vaccine, Chinese vaccine, and, and perhaps you will have the European and the Russian one, et cetera. And that's not a good way forward. I had a question about integration and, and you know future development. Um, I, sometimes I say that the future is integrated. Um, you know, you, you connect your phone to your car. Uh, your your phone has a number of apps uh, that is connected to hundreds of companies, and they have potentially thousands of connections to other organizations. And you know, the main driver behind that is to basically to make our lives easier. Right? We want to spend more time with our families and do other fun stuff with our time. But I mean, from my perspective, we've just seen the start of this. We've just scratched the surface of all the integration. And integration means data transfer, right? You are shuffling huge amounts of data back and forth between companies, between different technologies, um, different platforms, could be Facebook, could be basically anything else, right? And these are not only companies from US. What is your you know, what is your view on that? Because you kind of lose control, right? I mean, if you if you try to be in control today, how are you possibly going to be in control in the future when everything is going to be integrated and you want it to be integrated because that makes your life easier? So what is your idea about that? First of all, I'm not sure if people spend more time with their families now when everything was integrated. I felt I oftentimes have a, had a better glass of wine with friends uh, before everything was necessarily online and people tweeted 20 times a day. Um, but, but that aside, um, I think it's going to be interesting that we built these systems in smart ways and in privacy friendly ways. And um, to, to, to make that understandable, I'm the biggest fan of using a lot of these things, but I want to be able to trust it at the same time. And I think that's a, um, a future that we have to build somehow. That's going to take a while. It's, you know, if we're now in the digital um, revolution where it's a bit like, you know, the industrial revolution, we, it took us a hundred years to figure out how to get workers right, some workers right somehow right. And we're still debating it today how it is right. <laughs> so none of that is going to be, it's going to be have 
going to be ultimately successful and rather soon. Um, but I think it's important that people have the feeling that they can use stuff without losing control. And I think that is is the basic understanding of these privacy concepts is um, that these technologies should be around and you shouldn't have lost control. What's super important in to stress in that is the average user is not going to do it. Um, the average user will not understand how security works. It will you will not understand how. I, for example, I litigate Facebook for 10 years. I cannot tell you how Facebook exactly works. And I think most Facebook engineers cannot tell you all the details of that platform um, because it became so complex. So we need to find systems that that is policed, enforced, checked um, constantly and internally, and, and that there is a consequence also if you break the law. And I think there is still a big narrative that the user is somehow in charge of it, that the user should understand it. But the reality is the user is 70 years old and just wants to get you know pictures of grandchildren on their screen. <laughs> They're not going to go through any of that. And um, the industry was quite good at shifting that blame to the user. It's a bit like the tobacco industry's narrative of it's not the cigarettes as you smoking. And, and the big tech industry is not bad at, at saying you know it's not our product. It's your it's your wrong settings that you know cause privacy issues. I think we need to integrate that, and we did that in most other areas. Like. I drive a car, but I don't know how it works or how it technically makes sure that I'm not dying um, when I run against something. There are engineers and people that know that and that should do that well. And I think we need to get these systems in, in IT up as well. And it probably security is more of an area where that works because there's a common interest, but privacy, there's usually a, not a common interest to a large extent. And um, there, a lot of these things are not really enforced properly. And I think that's kind of the direction that, that I would hope we're going. Um, so that people can use systems without worrying much. And, and that's how we use everything else in life. Like I t take a train that runs 250 kilometers an hour. I haven't checked the tires, <laughs> and, um, but I still happily take trains, you know. No, I didn't do that either. But uh, <laughs> does this mean that, and you did that, before, that it's likely that we will need, because you, you cannot make, a, I mean, one of the issues, you cannot make agreements with every single organization, right? To be able to trust them. Uh, that comes too complicated. Uh, you believe that the solution would be more centralized? That you have in Europe, you have a one government agency making processing everything, making sure that everything, everyone is doing the right thing. But then, then of course, you have the issue with Europe, US, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm probably not the right person to talk about these things. There is a lo load of philosophical reasons to do technology one or the other way. We oftentimes have these debates in the office, even I sometimes call it religious. Um, but um, there are, you know, probably thoughts about how can we make stuff slimmer? How can we make it more efficient? There's still a lot of this just store everything, make it as fat as possible, which in, in some areas may not even be the best approach. And I think a lot of that will develop as, as we get better and so to say, um, innovative and innovative may oftentimes be innovation in more privacy. So far, they take this narrative of innovation and say, whenever we do the next terrible thing, it's innovative. Um, but oftentimes making stuff better is, is actually innovative. And if we look at, I don't know, the Green New Deal debates or whatever, then innovation is how can we make it slimmer? How can we make it more efficient and, 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 and you know, less polluting somehow? I think in some areas of the digital transformation, we, we have probably similar debates to have. Apart from yourself, are there any other, shall we say, special interest organizations uh, that could be supported or are showing the way in this field? I, um, I saw in the chat that NDYB was mentioned. I'm not sure about the that acronym, but um, basically, oh, EDRI, yeah. <laughs> so EDRI is basically the European network on the um, that most European data protection organizations or privacy or digital rights organizations are organized in. Um, we're also a member of EDRI, and that's kind of the network that um, coordinates stuff on the European level. EDRI itself mainly does lobbying in Brussels. So if you have the GDPR, you pretty much have 200 lobbyists from the industry and then one EDRI person there. Um, so if you want to support in that direction, that's definitely um, worth looking into. Um, Access Now does some of that in, on a European level. And then in the Adri network, you usually have your national member organizations. Um, there are still a lot of European companies, uh, countries that do not have a serious um, uh, digital rights organization. And a lot of these digital rights organizations are more lobbying organizations. So oftentimes said, you know, we are kind of more of the goal getter as an OIP. We're kind of enforcing the existing law 
And a lot of other organizations kind of do the ground game if we're in soccer speech that, you know, make sure that the ball gets rolling, that people are aware of stuff and that, you know, law is or legislation is passed or extremely, you know, fundamental rights, problematic legislation that is often a bigger issue really um, is not passed. Um, and Edry is usually the, the go-to page to also see what's, what's available in your country. I'm getting a bit conscious about time. Will there ever be a Shrems 3? I hope not. And uh, one of the reasons I firmly believe that is because the Court of Justice stopped naming cases after the litigants. <laughs> so, um, but quite honestly, I for a long, long time called it the Privacy Shield and the Safe Harbor decision because it's so awkward that your name is plastered to a decision and you now go to privacy pages and there is like a whole menu called Shrems 2. <laughs> and uh, um, I often have said I should have probably trademarked that word somehow <laughs> and, and asked them to, to you know, pay me a buck every time they use it. I would be a millionaire by now. <laughs> um, but it's, it's very interesting because from the beginning, I actually said I don't want to be in the public. I don't want pictures taken. I, you know, I don't want any of that. Um, but privacy is a very, it's, it's not a tangible topic. So you need a face, you need a story. So uh, on, on a smaller scale, it's like that Greta Thunberg phenomenon. Like you can't take pictures of CO2, but you can take pictures of a kid. So <laughs> you suddenly have that person there. And I was uh, joking, I was like, I, I guess I became that privacy clown now to, you know, basically <laughs> sit there and make and, 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 and have that face on it, even though it's, it's quite honestly not always the, the, the most fun part. Um, I'm, I'm oftentimes more happy to be in the second row and work on stuff than necessarily presented <laughs> okay future. future will tell future will tell them i'd just like to encourage the audience to post any final questions because we are clearly running out of time and with that said stefan yeah i i think you you have inspired a lot of people max so i, I guess that there will be people following you now and you 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 will see another name on the with the number three there probably um <laughs> if i guess do you think uh just a quick uh Final question from me, uh, if we have time, Peter. Um, just, uh, do, do you think that there's a risk that US considered the privacy battle, if I can call it that, to be a tool just to equal uh, competition from a commercial perspective? In, in what sense? Well, you have all the, again, you have all these huge US companies, right? Uh, infrastructure, you know, wherever you go, you have these US companies, right? And is there a risk that that in U.S. they will look at it and say, you know, you're just using privacy as a tool to level out the competition because you want to have, you know, infrastructure in Europe. You want to have, you know, cybersecurity products in Europe. You want to have all of that in Europe. And privacy is not actually the issue. It's a commercial issue. Yeah, um, there is an argument for that. And quite honestly, in when the GDPR was negotiated, I think that that idea was in the minds of some politicians, to be to be honest. Um, so um, there is there is no full denial for that. Um, I don't think it's the right tool. I think what we actually need in Europe is is open and interoperable systems, and that would be for especially the whole B2P community. The really interesting part is in Europe we have a tradition to open up systems. We opened up electricity grids. We opened up telecom grids. We opened up train lines everything. We have really like ongoing competition. If you tell an American that you have the option of 10 different internet providers, they get a heart attack because it's unthinkable. <laughs> and, and the interesting thing what happened online is that we had a closed, a, an open system, and now we have these closed networks sitting on top of it, and these big monopolies, duopolies, whatever it is. And I think one approach in Europe that would make a lot of sense is to say, all well and good, but you have to be interoperable and you have to have open standards and open um, APIs because that would allow, for example, that I, you know, that you have 10 Facebooks and you can still communicate across them. And we had that, it's not new. I mean, that's how email works. You can send from any email provider to any other email provider. That's how the internet originally works. And I think there is a lot of benefit in that. And that would be a more honest approach to it to say that also allows a local company to participate in, in, in the market um, or just a local market without being overrun by by big companies. And that's very typical old European regulation. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max and Stefan and all of those who participated today. This has been fantastic and very informative. I would like to hand over to Chris for the final words and uh, I hope to see you soon again.
Thank you. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Max, Peter, and Stefan for this profound discussion. There's a lot of value in what you shared with us today. Uh, I think what really was important about it is it makes it very real for some people in different sectors that maybe hadn't realized the impact that it has on them before. Sure, you read the Financial Times, you're gonna find out about the issue in Ireland yesterday. But if you're in, for example, a gaming company, it may not always hit home, but it might come too late if you're not actively and proactively protecting your, your clients or your players' information. So I just do wanna close out with a couple of quick things. Uh, obviously, we've had an amazing session there and we're thankful for the participation of everybody, including our media partners who helped get everybody assembled for today's session. So a reminder that uh, Young Entrepreneurs of Sweden, Sigma Group, Sports Betting Community, Swedish Data Center Industry Association, and AO.News were very helpful in, in that side of things. And as promised, you do have the opportunity to book a personal consultation with experts from Internet Vikings or Home Security and receive some personalized insights about data transfers and privacy protection in the field of hosting or cybersecurity. Now, you can see on the link in the chat box, and by clicking on it, you will have the chance to schedule your appointment. But wait, there's more. Uh, when I, I talked about things growing up, you think you'd become famous. Well, when we were young, this wasn't a thing, but kids today, they may want to become face mask models. So uh, I, we do have a couple of extra ones of these kicking around the office. I would suggest that the first 20 people that do request consultations with either of our groups will be welcome to get uh, one of these face masks sent out to them. Uh, and I guess I just have to put it on because it's time to go and join the real world again and get outside into the, 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 great, the great afternoon that we have here in Malta. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And uh, please do click on our website and we will see you soon.